Are you ready to take your real estate investing business to the next level? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. With your mentors, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning and welcome to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Today is Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. The weather today will be a high of minus 4 degrees in Edmonton, minus 8 degrees in Calgary, 10 degrees in Vancouver, minus 3 degrees in Saskatoon, and 20 degrees in Toronto. <laughs> Thanks, Evie. You're really upset about Toronto's weather, hey? <laughs> You look really upset. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you move there? Yeah. Hey, hey good morning, everybody. Uh, can I take my first sip of coffee? Sure. I'm just going to share it with everyone. Not bad. Excuse Not bad. me? All right. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. We're broadcasting live with a fresh cup of coffee. As we do every morning, uh, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Mountain Time on the Podbean app. If you want to be a part of the live show and hang out with other cool real estate investors, uh, all you got to do is just download that app, Podbean, and then search up the show and you will get notified when we are live in the morning. Um, obviously, perks to joining the live show are, again, you get to hang out with other real estate investors in the morning, um, networking, uh, community. Do you have any other flashy words? Um Education. Dope. <laughs> but not like we're not going to give you dope. Um, but it is dope. Doobie. <laughs> no, no, we're, no, it's no drugs. Um, this is a drug free real estate investing community. Uh, and, and, and the ability to, I don't know if you want to now, but the ability to get your, your questions answered. Uh, we will answer any question that you have about real estate investing for free every morning. It's free coaching. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing some of the questions we have today. Let's try and keep some of the questions today to financing, though, mm -hmm. because we got a super, super special guest. Keaton Kirkwood, Investor Focused Mortgage Broker, uh, is going to be on here shortly. And he's going to be giving us an update on what the heck's going on with mortgages and financing and lenders. Um, just a, just a, just a, a cornucopia of uh, updates. <laughs> what is so a funny? hodgepodge? Yeah, a little, yeah, a little hod uh, hodgepodge. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, looking forward to that. Do we have anything left over from yesterday that we were supposed to address? I don't think so. Address or undress? I think that would, you check your little note, your little note sheet thing. You keep all their questions. I think we got through everything. Talked about cats. Yeah. Do you remember we had a tenant that got deported? Yeah. I forgot about that. I remembered about her um, because she moved out at the, well, she didn't move out. She was, air quotes, deported um, at the beginning of 2022. So um, when I was filling out like UHT forms and like going through our properties, I was reminded of her. Yeah. And um, to this day, I, will, I, I know she's in Edmonton. I'm going to find her. Yeah, because like <laughs> there was there was so much of it, like other stuff that led up to it. Like she wasn't responding, didn't pay rent. And then I went down to the house to to put the notice on the door because she wasn't responding. And I just tried knocking and she opened. And she's like, yeah, I've been in the hospital. I had COVID. And then, and then yeah. she got deported after that. Um, so she's like, yeah, I'm going to send the rent today. Um, it must've been so intimidating for her for like me to come to the door and like knock on it though. I've never done that before, but like, I didn't, we didn't hear anything from her. So yeah. like we put, actually, we put a 24 hour notice that we were going to go in mm -hmm. because we weren't sure if she was even still there. Yeah. And then, uh, shortly after that, she told us she was being deported by Canada. Maybe she just had like a, a bad couple of weeks, <laughs> COVID and deported. Nah, she's probably still in Edmonton. Yeah. That might've been one of the most elaborate excuses we've ever heard. 100%. Um, yeah, I was thinking about her the other day. Um, and what else? I made some notes. I don't know, whatever. 
I was going to talk about that another day, but I'm just like, this is, you told me to go through my notes. I'm like, oh, I want to talk about that one these days. So that's all I'm going to say about that. How did we handle that? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, what? <laughs> it was actually like, I, one of the main reasons I was like, um, like, you know, we could have just been like, okay, whatever. But like, she left the place such a mess. Issue. And like there was like a broken window, like that front um, window light or door light, whatever they're called at the front door was broken and like just all this stuff. And and of course she vanished because she was deported. So there was nothing we can do. So like all of the repairs and cleaning and like all that stuff was was far exceeded her deposit. And she just ghosted like she she was just like, I'm out. Peace. And so I was just like, you know what? First of all, I didn't even believe her story yeah. just because there was so many like gaps and she couldn't provide like documentation. And then she just stopped replying. So I was like, I didn't believe her. And then she just left us with like that mess after we were like really nice to her for the time she was there. Oh, well, should we hire a private investigator? <laughs> we do that. Anyways, it was fine. We did what we do. We sent in our handyman. We sent in our cleaner. We cleaned it up. We rented it. It's fine. How much do you think we are out after the security deposit? Uh, probably under a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I can't quite remember, but like it, it's a it's a higher rent on um, rent on the suite. It's like a main floor suite that got pretty good rent. So yeah. we had a decent um, security deposit. But there's like some walls that needed to be patched and repainted. And so it adds up. Yeah. Yeah. But like didn't ruin us. No. Or oh, gosh, no. It's just I was just annoyed. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a valuable lesson. And we had a, a partner on that property, too. So that's always, you know, not a fun thing to be like, oh, yeah, hey, this happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's a valuable lesson in there. It's like, you know, even even something that, something like that would, would most people find pretty stressful. But once you once you've had a few tenants and you've been doing it a while, it's like eh, I don't know. She's probably lying. I mean, it doesn't matter if she is. You yeah. Know what I mean? are we gonna do about it? What are you gonna? Well, that's that's exactly it. What am I gonna do about it? Is there she's anything? Gone. Yeah. Is there anything I can do? Can I go after her for the money uh, that exceeded the security deposit? Well, I don't know where she is. She could be in um, Rwanda, or she could be in Canada can't say for certain. Mm -hmm. Am I going to hire a private investigator to go and hunt her down? Probably not. Uh, if I can't find her within an hour on social media, then is it really worth it? I mean, we can pull up her employer on her lease and go drive down to her place of employment and ask if she still lives, works oh, there. We, uh, short of driving, we actually called and um, we you called. You keep saying we. I didn't, I didn't know about any of this. Yeah, you do. You just you can't remember because I did the calling. But like okay. these were conversations we had. All right. Um, but yeah, I did. I called her employer. And that was like the other like um, weird thing was because – I think like partway through her tenancy, she like changed jobs or something. Yeah. And like, I, th I feel like I knew about it, but when I called to, to like, be like, yo, like where's she at? I didn't say that, but you know what I mean? Um, they were like, uh, no, we don't, we, we don't have anybody by that name. And no, our records don't show anybody by that name. Okay. And like, yeah, she, it was like, she didn't exist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Interesting. And like, of course, when she moved in, we verified employment and stuff. So I think it was a, like, she transferred jobs or something in the uh, middle, but that it wasn't truthful. I don't know. So like the whole thing was just like really weird. <laughs> so at that particular point, you're like, I, I've got no leads whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. And like how far, how long, how much money, how much time do I want to spend on this in order to find her, to serve her documents for a court hearing, for a claim for $900 and then get the order, get the writ of enforcement, file it, and try and collect from her? She's if like, maybe she's in Edmonton. At that point, <laughs> I mean, like, I could, I could make $900 significantly faster doing something else in far less time and far less energy. Mm -hmm. I've got great feet that I could sell on OnlyFans, <laughs> and I could make that in a day. So you kind of have to weigh, like, what's the value of your time? Mm-hmm. What's the value of doing that? What's the value of your feet? And then make the decision. And yeah. so we moved on. Yeah. 
There's also like had her situation not been. Everybody wants to know if I if I sold pictures of my feet. Okay. Did you? Uh, stay tuned for Friday. We got Keaton Kirkwood coming on, and I'm going to leave a little cliffhanger. Make sure you come uh, for the last day of the week. What were you going to say? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, you interrupted don't me. Like that. <laughs> you interrupted me. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say in, in a different situation where like we knew that like we weren't like, is she here? Is she not here? Like we also have like, um, you know, where, you know, when somebody leaves a place a mess and like, you know, it exceeds their damage deposit. Like we kind of have this thing where it's like the the like morals of it. It's like they're going to be held responsible. So you file yeah, and you do the, you know, 15 minute telephone hearing because it's not a big deal. Because, you know, we know what we're doing. And then you at least get the judgment against them. Whether we collect or not, eh, I don't know. Worth yeah. our time? I don't know. But just, like, going through and being like, you're not going to get away with this. Like, you know what I mean? You, we're, we're, f we're filing against you. Don't do this to other landlords. Like, oh, because you want to get a court order. I want to get a court order. In judgment in them. our favor yeah. against them so that it shows up. If anyone was to ever pull court order judgments against them, yeah. they're going to see that they lost. Yeah. Okay. And also they might just, it might scare them into like, shit, I've never been taken to, you know, the RTDRS and had to do all this and, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. It, it might scare them from, you know, being shitheads again in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Shit boxes, mm -hmm. is that what we said? I think you said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. No, that makes total sense. Um, I can't believe we forgot about that kind of stuff. It, someone, um, I think I saw... Uh, we're going to take a break here in a second, but someone, um, he was in a landlord tenant uh, Facebook group the other day. A tenant was saying that they settled um, damages and expenses that they owed to the landlord two years ago. And then they just got served notice uh, of a court hearing for $40,000 today. And they're like, can they do that? <laughs> um now, of course, like the tenant's probably not telling the whole story. They're probably like, hey, I'll give you this much, but that's all I'm giving you. I'm not giving you, a, you know, all the money to, re to, to repair all these damages, apparently $40,000 in damages. Um, but they waited two years to serve them mm -hmm. um, for the hearing, mm -hmm. and but, which you can do. Yeah. I think that there's a three-year um, limit on it or two years. I can't remember. Yeah. Up to two or three years that you can you can serve afterwards. And, uh, yeah, the tenant got served uh, and and – I was when I read that I'm like, oh man, there's so many tenants that I'd like to just mm -hmm. go after them now. Well, you know, normally when like when they're leaving on like bad terms like that, it's usually unpaid rent and like all this kind of stuff, and they're not in a good place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they like they probably have a you know maybe got fired and can't pay their rent or laid off or whatever. So filing at that time is like okay, you get your judgment, but like, are you going to be able to collect from them? No, probably not. Yeah, timing's and not right. yeah, timing's not right. So sometimes if you wait two years for them to get their shit together, and then you know you might yeah. actually be able to collect and like you know have them make right. <laughs> yeah, we've we've said over the last couple of years that like one of these days we're going to spend like a month and we're going to gather up all the delinquents. <laughs> Uh, tenants that we've ever had and we're going to file all of them in one month and we're going to make like 30 or 40 grand in one no, month. No, we definitely don't have money like that out to us. No? No. Oh, come on. No. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. All right. I think it's... And some of them are far past two or three years. All right. Like if you think about recent stuff, like no. Nah. Uh, okay. I guess it's not that bad. Yeah. All right. Let's take a break. Sound good? Yep. Are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio? At Kirkwood & Brennan, we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing. Not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. <laughs> Gabby, over the commercial, she's like, uh, you're going to scare people. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no. first of all, that's not true. And second of all, you're going to scare people. <laughs> What's not true? <laughs> that like we would have $30,000 owed to us. Like, I thought it was 30. No. 20? No, God, no. 10? Like probably under five. Okay. Uh, now that you say two to three years, I'm like, okay, yeah, probably. I, mean, whatever. I think like our first two tenants from like over a decade ago are probably the highest owing ones. Okay. Yeah. 
you say so. <laughs> hey guys, if you're planning on buying your next investment property and you weren't discouraged about everything we said this morning, <laughs> uh, make sure to give our friends Calvin Realty a call if you're planning on buying in the Edmonton area. Uh, they're pretty great. And I'm going to read one of their Google reviews uh, so you could see what some of their clients are saying. Uh, Calvin helped us through the sale of my mother's home from finding a great contractor for repairs and painting and recommending resources and, and support. He is supportive and very helpful through the process and the house sold in the first 10 days on the market. Whoop, whoop. Lovely. Yeah, that is lovely. All right. <laughs> okay. So let's, um, let's get our good friend, uh, Keaton Kirkwood on here. Let's do it. Let me take a second to, uh. To get him invited. Well, hello. Good morning, Keaton. Good morning. How are you guys? Awesome. Is is Keaton a little bit quiet for you? He is. But I think I got it though. Okay. <laughs> My third set of headphones. <laughs> um. Yeah. We'll 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 see how it all plays out. Maybe it's Podbean. Maybe it's not you, Keaton. Oh, it's one hundred percent Podbean. It's it's not you. <laughs> oh well. So it's an interesting day. We are gonna see a rate announcement today. Ooh. Oh those always creep up on me. I don't pay attention and then it's like bam, it's here. Wait, increase? Uh odds are no, but nobody knows. That's oh what that was a very pessimistic approach to it. We're gonna say uh, we're gonna see a rate gonna increase. Hold, but no, no, no. I think the majority of the expectations are gonna stay put, but the reality is their expectations. We don't know till they announce. Ah, okay. Now, uh, uh, Trung in the comments says, shit rate announce again. <laughs> Why do these it's keep bad. happening? Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I think I think we're good. I think we're in a positive direction. I'm just going to put out that that good juju, that that good uh, positive energy that may, maybe maybe they'll lower it. <laughs> what is the saying? If candy or what is it? If, ifs and buts were wishes. We'd all have a very Merry Christmas or something along those lines. Just keep that positivity going, right? Because that's how the world works, right? I've never heard that. <laughs> oh, if gifts and bots for candy and nuts, we'd all have a very Merry Christmas. I think. Oh, there we go. I like it. I'm going to use that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if my if my butt was candy, <laughs> I'd Merry be Christmas. nuts with, and have a Merry Christmas. That's what I'm going to definitely say. I always, Are I you always expanding try. your foot picture business? Is that what I'm <laughs> If my butts were candy, uh, is my only fans uh, handle. Yeah. <laughs> How's well, it well, going, well. Keaton? <laughs> you want to talk about mortgages, or are you going to share this with your network? <laughs> oh, always. <laughs> yeah, Isn't that I, your I, tagline I, the lovable whack job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my God. Okay, Keaton contributes to the Gong Show. That is the first part of our show. Keaton and I are on the same page. <laughs> always. Yeah, it's been an interesting, uh, it's been an interesting month. So uh, Wayne has clearly been a little bit of a stormy cloud lately because bond yields have been going up. So he has not been wishing for low rates enough, everybody. And we all need to point our finger at Wayne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Wayne, Wayne's a little bit too negative about those, those yeah. bond yields. Okay. The only Got rational it? explanation. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's been interesting. So bond yields have been going up and I think a lot of people have been feeling the pressure. Um, the good news is that statistically, we should be near the peak based on if we just overlay what's happening now compared to what's happened historically. If we follow the average, we should be at the peak in the next month or two. And then we should be there for a couple of months and start to come down. The okay. downside is that the longest cycle that we've been through went up for about six years. So our, our kind of worst case based on historical is, you know, we're a third of the way through maybe. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we shall see. But uh, the good news is I really, really doubt we'll see an increase today. We should see things stabilize a little bit. And, um, you know, at least good news. We all knew rates were going up for a while. So this shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, for sure. Did, were we expecting um, two years? Yeah. Keaton, we have a we have a whole bunch of um, kind of like newbie investor listeners um, that listen to our show. Can you just very briefly explain um, bond yields and what the impact of that is, what that means? 
Sure. So there's two mechanisms that drive up interest rates. There are the Bank of Canada meetings, which happen every six weeks. One of them is today. Those increase the overnight lending rate, which is the cost of money for variable products of banks. So that's going to be your home equity line of credits, unsecured lines of credit, and variable slash adjustable rate mortgages. So they're meeting today. They're going to decide what they do with that. So if you've heard of Mortgage Prime, that's controlled by the Bank of Canada, essentially and indirectly. On the other side, you have fixed rate mortgages, one to five year fixed rate mortgages, seven and 10. They're controlled by bond yields. Now bond yields move up and down based on kind of the, the bond trader market, which essentially you can think of as just the big banks. So we've got one mechanism controlled by the government that tends to be a little bit more political, which is variable rates. And then we have another mechanism, which is bond yields that is controlled kind of by the stock market in a sense, and its expectations of what the government may or may not do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Does that make sense to everybody else? I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I'm a, I'm a, a, I'm a pretty, pretty smart guy. That stuff just goes over my head every single time. <laughs> when Gabby said we have a lot of new investors and newbie investors, she was like, she was kind of like thinking like, Wayne doesn't understand this. So can you repeat it again? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, like, we all just heard about? how involved Wayne is in the real estate business. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like Wayne just shows up on doors, crosses his arms. Yeah, he's like, what? He's pay. <laughs> we did what? <laughs> if ifs and buts were candy, <laughs> pay the rent. Um, no, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it always goes from my, and to be honest, I'll under, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get a good understanding of it and then I'll just forget. And that's the thing. And every, and then you come back and then you explain it again. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't news, And I'll be really blunt. It doesn't matter. That's At the end of the day, you need to go look for good, good deals, good long-term solid properties. If it's really a good property and it's a good deal, what rates do today, tomorrow, next week, doesn't really matter. Exactly. The reality of it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly my position on it. I'm like, it's not my, I don't really need to understand it. I have a great power team that understands it. And if I find a great deal, then I, I take whatever rates are available at that particular time. Now, I do need to, you know, stay kind of up to date. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm subscribed to your newsletter and we have you on the show on a regular basis to kind of give us updates on what's up and what's going on and, and where we're at. So I can kind of run those numbers in my performa quickly, um, just roughly, but Otherwise, you're exactly right, Keaton. It's it is what it is. Like, what are you going to do about it? And and my role, other than crossing arms and selling pictures of feet, is to is to find good deals and to raise capital. And that's what I'm really, really good at. Hundred percent. Play to your strengths, right? I actually had a, a profound moment with Arlen Dahlin last month at the Mogul meeting. It was interesting. We were chatting about the Smith maneuver and I was, I was ribbing him because he always says, ah, I don't like the Smith maneuver. It's not scalable. And I've always kind of rolled my eyes at that. And uh, with a group of investors and I made fun of him for it. And he, he looked over and he shared something that has actually shifted my perspective, which doesn't happen that often. Once you've, you know, you get a decade in the industry, you kind of hear most things, most versions of things. Yeah. But he made the point that a- as investors, just people in general, We need to look at the options in front of us because we only have so much time and energy to learn. Now, there's going to be certain things like evaluating properties, planning our burrs, you know, digging into the actual investing side. Now, that is something that as real estate investors, we're going to do over and over and over. That's a skill worth investing in. But something like the Smith Maneuver, which you're going to set up once on your primary residence and then probably not ever do it again, that's not a repeatable skill you're going to use. So he made the point that you should invest in the things, invest your time and energy into the things you will do over and over. If something's a one-off, even if it's expensive, hire an expert, let that expert do that one-off for you. Focus on the things you will do over and over and over. And it may sound really, really straightforward, but I'm a simple guy. And I was like, damn, that makes sense. And it shifted my perspective of how to explain and guide clients. And I thought I'd share. It was kind of interesting and Today's another real estate investing meetup. So <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Arlen and I aren't always on the same page with stuff, but uh, I completely agree with that too. And that's the whole reason why we haven't done the Smith Maneuver. It's just been like, I get it. I was one of the first people that ordered, you know, the new revised book when um, 
Robinson. When Robinson uh, released it, because I'd, I'd, re- I'd, I'd looked into Fraser years before and I'm like, I freaking love this. And I was following, I, I, I subscribed to the newsletter of smithman.net or whatever it is. And then uh, Robinson announced that he was going to be releasing a new version. And I was like, heck yeah, I pre-ordered it. And, and like nobody really was talking about it at that time. So like I'm, I'm all about the Smith maneuver. But like same thing, like I just haven't had the time to really just sit down and like figure out how is this going to help me. Um, and, and one of these days we're going to get around to it. And one of these days we're going to like set it up. But it's, it's you know, it's a, it's, it's a big thing. So um, but- I think it just goes, but I think it like I think the whole big concept that we're talking about right now is just focus. Yeah. Like in the grand scheme of things, it's being focused on what's driving you forward to your goals and not being distracted by this and by that and by the new this and the, oh, did you hear they passed, you know, zoning for this and like all, all the things that come up, it's like, it's all distractions. And if you stay focused, yeah, maybe those things could have like helped with something over here, helped with something over there, but your focus allowed you to get where you were going way faster. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent reminds me of a rant that someone may have gone on last month about kind of your, your why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting one, but I, I think it's, it's true. And a lot of investors, a lot of people in general, when they're getting into something new and exciting suffer from so many options, so little time. And I think it's more important to figure out what's the thing you're most likely to do the most focus on that. And that's what a power team, coaches, mentors, they fill in the gaps. 100%. Absolutely. 100%. So Keaton, what, um, back to, um, back to financing and mortgages in Canada right now. Um, we got the, uh, announcement today, uh, to see whether we know where the rates are going to go. Um, what about mortgage rates right now for fixed and variable? I know you sent out a newsletter last month that gave us an update of where things are for insured, uninsured, personal mortgages. Um, let's just maybe just stick on uninsured mortgages for investment properties. Uh, where where are we at right now with interest rates? You know, generally speaking. So you're looking if you're buying a rental property, you're looking at probably a five year fixed, which is going to be your lowest cost option right now. Is going to be probably 6.5 to 6.6 percent best case it's going to okay. go up from there so this is important for renewals coming up this is important for buying new properties and there's a fork in the road that everybody has to face and that is there's going to be an option that has a lower cost and a higher qualifying amount so you'll pay less and you qualify for more that's a five-year fixed but you have to ask yourself do you want to lock into five years of six and a half, 6.6, 6.7%. Because there's something important that you all need to know. And that is when you take a five year fixed mortgage, a fixed mortgage in general, something's going to happen over the term of the mortgage. So how long you're locked in, that's five years. Rates are either going to go up, which case your penalties will go down, or rates are going to go down. And I think we can all agree that there's a pretty good chance over the next five years, rates are going to trend down at some point. Yeah. So if you're locked in at six and a half percent, you call up Wayne for your coaching session and he says, yeah, we just got a new, new rental. We've, we've got four and a half percent. Pretty cool. And you're like, oh shit, I want that. And you go and you start investigating breaking your mortgage at six and a half percent with three years left. You're going to find that the penalty is probably going to be six to eight percent of the mortgage size. It's going to be massive. So remember, oh, but fixed rate mortgages, the penalties go up as rates drop relative to what you have locked in. The bank wins no matter what. So if rates go up and six and a half looks really good, they're happy to let you off the hook because they're going to go lend out for eight. But if rates go down, they're going to make sure you pay every dollar interest you might save by going somewhere else. So make Mm -hmm. sure that you really consider your options before you just default with, oh, that's the cheapest option and I qualify for 30 grand more because it might not be the cheapest option over the next five years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And... I'm not going to put you on the spot with this because I know it depends on each individual person, but do you lean more towards a certain uh, mortgage product than others right now or a term? Generally speaking, I think the three-year fixed is kind of like the Swiss army knife. So what happens is as you go shorter, (laughs) the cost goes up. So a one year might cost seven and a half to 8% on a rental. 
a two year might be the low sevens, a three year might be the high sixes. So it's, it's a balance. There's no perfect choice. I'll be honest. All your options suck, but <laughs> you got to figure out which option sucks the least for you. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, you know, you can look at it however you want. I like to make fun of this, right? Like at the end of the day, it is what it is. Real estate investing is going to make you money. You need to figure out the options available and figure out what works best for you based on your goals. Generally speaking, I would argue the three year fixed is the go the least wrong option because it's going to three years should be enough to get through whatever we're going through. It is a little more expensive than a five year fix, but not a whole lot more. Typically speaking in two years and three months. So with nine months left on the mortgage, you'll be in a three months interest penalty. So you could break in roughly two and a bit years with a relatively modest penalty. And typically speaking, two and a half years from now, so six months remaining, the lender will consider an early renewal. So it's one of those, it gives you enough coverage to get to the other side of the strangeness going on with interest rates. But it's also short enough that you're not trapped forever. You're not married to this rate and just stewing on it for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, I was just imagining the time comes and the rates start to drop, you know, fingers crossed. And do you think that people are going to be quick to jump on those like early renewals or maybe even like you said, breaking at the two year mark if they have a year left as the rates start to drop? Or do you think that people are going to kind of like hold on and be like, are they going to continue to drop? Like, where are we going to land? Like, (laughs) do you think that there's going to be like a frenzy when they start to go down? Or do you think that like, do you know what I'm trying to get at here? I get you 100%. And and the reality is it's going to be a mixed bag. So whenever rates drop or rates change, we do something really simple called a cost benefit analysis. Does it make sense? And at that time, you just need to make a decision. Hey, you can break. It's going to cost you $4,000. You're going to recoup that $4,000 in 18 months. Over the following 18 months, you'll save an additional $4,000. Okay, great. Does that make sense? And for someone else, it might be, hey, you don't, you break even with two months left. It just doesn't make sense right now. The problem is it's no different than when the housing market's sliding down or the stock market's sliding down. It's no different than a few years ago when rates are low. When's the bottom? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So I think that as investors, we have to accept that we're in the space of business. Now, business is not necessarily about making the maximum money possible because that's just not, we can't replicate it. We can get lucky with it. Instead, we have to look at the situation and say, how does this property align with our long-term goals? Do I love it? Do I hate it? Is it somewhere in the middle? Do I have a a tenant that I think is going to get deported? Do I think there's issues with this property? (laughs) Or is, hey, I've got, you know, Jack and Jill live in the property with their three kids. They've already told me they're going to die in that property. And I love it. It's great. They're going to live there forever. They fix it. So based on the asset, you need to make a decision. Now, if it's a good long-term asset you want to hold, well, hey, if rates drop and who knows if it's the bottom and you're like, you know what? I can take five years at four and a half percent. That feels pretty good compared to what we went through. And you want to own it long term and the numbers make sense. Well, maybe you just hedge your bets. You don't have to worry about it. Could it be better? Maybe. Could it be worse? Maybe. But now that property's locked up. It's dealt with. It's turnkey. You push it to the side. You focus on something else. Mm-hmm. And I think that investors have to have that approach rather than clutching the stick, trying to micromanage every little thing. Because the reality is nobody knows you're going to go crazy trying to predict the future, make good, sound decisions that have a rational backing to them, where you understand the pros and cons. If you're happy with the decision, make it. It's that simple. Yeah. I love that you said that because that's exactly like, I think our thought process is, you know, like the market is the market. Like we can't control it. We can't predict it. There's nothing we can do about it except make the best decisions that we can at the time that we need to make those decisions. And like Wayne and I have bought in every different, you know, we've, we are still clutching onto properties at like 1.6%. Um, we have, you know, properties in the threes in the fives in the high sixes, like our properties are all over the map. And it's just like, as that time comes, it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do? This is what we got. Like you just, you, you carry on and make that best decision at that time. And it's not like we're sitting here going like, okay, if we can just, you know, I think that really in 
two years that's probably going to drop. So maybe we should just do a two year instead of a three year or like, it's not those kinds of discussions. It's like, okay, you know, there's a renewal coming up. It's looking like we're probably at least a couple years out from like rate drops. Let's just settle on that kind of like three year term. And like, it is what it is. It's whatever percent it's at. That's probably the best thing we can do. Okay, done. Lock it in, move on. Yeah. And we don't dwell over it. We don't, we aren't, you know, in a couple of years, we're not going to be like, oh shit, we should have done that two year. Now we're screwed for another year. Like it's none of that. We don't ever regret our decisions. We just make the best ones that we can. Right? 100%. And that's the reality of it. You have to stay loosely on top of the changes happening in the market. Periodically, you need to reassess how those changes will impact you moving forward. And as an example, if you're debating between a two and a three year fix, okay, we'll break it down. There's pros and cons. Two years shorter. So it's got a better best case because if rates drop, you'll get to them faster. Mm -hmm. It's got a worse, worse case because if rates go up, you're going to get exposed to them sooner. It's mm -hmm. got a higher interest rate. Therefore, your cash flow will be weaker. Three year on the flip side has a better cash flow, longer period of protection, but you get to better rates later because it's for longer. Simple, break it down. Okay, which one looks better to me? That one. Okay. Ask your professional a couple of questions. If I break this, if I this, that, the other thing. As long as it checks out, great, make the decision, move on. The amount of people that I see that spiral, they get stuck. It's no good comes out of spending 40 hours obsessing on a relatively small decision. Pros, cons, cost benefit analysis, make a decision, move forward with your life. Mm -hmm. That's that's a, that's a good one right there. Yeah. That's, well, I'll that's ask cool. you guys, you mentor tons of very successful people. You have your own mentors, your own coaches. Do you know anyone that's really, really successful that is indecisive? No, no absolutely no. not. No. It, that's a very, very important skill to possess is, and I certainly did not possess it in the beginning of our investing career. Um, I was very indecisive and, and I relied heavily on Wayne to make decisions and to trust that he was making good decisions because I would get paralyzed in them. But with exposure and time, it's a skill that can be built. And the more that you tell yourself, I just need to make the damn decision and move on and know that I'm going to live with it, um, the easier it gets. Like you just, it's, it's a practice though. You need to, you need to actually put it into practice for that skill to build and develop. But you, but 100% no, we do not know anybody successful who has a hard time making a, making a decision. No, I, I absolutely agree with you personally. And I find that <clears throat> Rarely do decisions get better the more you think about them. No. There's a difference between thinking about something over and over and analyzing something. If you are moving forward, if you're building knowledge, gaining an understanding of how that decision applies to your circumstances, it can be productive. Not always, but it can be. But if you're simply going over the same information over and over and over, it's, in my opinion, in my experience, a self-confidence thing. You don't trust yourself. If that's mm -hmm. the case, call Lab Gabby and Wayne. Call me. Call a professional. Get another opinion and then make a decision. I, if you really can't decide, then, hey, both options are probably great. They're equally good and bad. Pull a name out of a hat. Yeah, toss a coin. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've literally had high net worth clients that are incredibly sophisticated decide on products by flipping a coin. I'm not kidding. Because they knew that neither option really mattered and they just they were stuck. So they just made a decision. Yeah, well, the decision is the most important thing. We've been having a lot of conversations about decisions lately. Yeah, I was just going to say this is a this is a relevant topic. It's a very <laughs> relevant because this is one we've been really stressing on for the last couple of weeks. Um, well, and one thing I want to point out is, Gabby, you've shared a little bit. You've alluded to your own personal growth and development, and mm -hmm. like props on you one for doing it, and two for sharing it because I, I do a fair bit of public speaking now. In 2017, I had to speak at a group and I got three hours notice and long story short, I wasn't prepared and, you know, wasn't fun. I go up on stage, I get halfway through this little five minute thing and my brain just shuts off and I walk off stage. <laughs> <laughs> we all suck when we start, whether it's decision making, yeah. it's real estate investing, whatever it is. We don't actually suck, but we think we do. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that's the biggest part is just pushing through it. Mm -hmm. Nobody is where they are today without starting somewhere else. And mm -hmm. if you're just starting today, great. It's the, it's the hardest part, the biggest step. So, you know, if you're like, well, that's great, Gabby. You're good at it. Keaton, that's cool. You're an expert. But that's not me. 
No, no, no. We were all. We didn't start here. Yeah. We were all where you are right now. Yeah. And I think that's hard for people to understand is that, um, you know, with just the world as it is today, everybody just sees and thinks that everybody has instant success and, oh, they got there so quickly or they did their, oh, they're so lucky. And they refuse to look at the journey that the person took to get where they are today and everything they've experienced, not only just in, in whatever, you know, career, their, you know, real estate investing career, whatever, but their entire life where they started, what, what you know, skills they learned as a child and how they had to develop into an adult and all those types of things, what job they held that that brought out certain skills that they now possess. And every, no, everybody just wants to be like, oh, we're, we're all equal, but they, they're lucky and they got there. And why are they so successful? Instead of realizing that everybody's on their own journey and everybody has, you know, had to work on themselves and had to do a lot of things to get to where they are today, whether you can see it or not. Instead of that instant comparison, we all need to realize that we all just have to go on our own journey of growth. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I do have a couple other lending updates because I'm bad for just running into the weeds. So Please. we're starting to see the mortgage world evolve to the newer situations. So we are seeing the regulators changing their rules. And then we are seeing the banks responding. So one of the big changes we've seen is so B lenders are regulated by the federal government, a group called OSFI. So they have to follow the same framework of rules as the major banks. Well, they finally made a counter move to this. They've started one of the big B lenders has partnered with a private lender to offer lending through the guise of the B lender that does not need to follow the government's rules. So we're starting to see, and I don't think there's going to be a whole lot the government can do, or OSFI is probably a more accurate statement, the Office of Finance, or what is it? The Superintendent of Financial Institutions is the, the name. <laughs> um, but okay. they're, the, they're the, uh, the one that regulates all the lenders, other than the credit unions and unregulated lenders. Now, we're starting to see these changes happen, and that's going to cause some friction and it may lead to the regulator saying, okay, you stop doing that. We'll back off a little bit. It may lead to the regulator just getting frustrated and other lenders being like, oh, great, that's the solution. And then they'll all do it. But it is overall good news because we're going to hit periods of change followed by periods of frustration because the industry has not caught up to that change. And then we're going to have periods of innovation and solution. So... Just remember that because if you're looking at numbers over and over and you're like, it just doesn't work, it just doesn't work, we're not going to be here forever. Rents may increase, rates may drop, amortizations may extend, your strategies may evolve. But it's important that not only do you look at opportunities with a lens of today, but also a lens of tomorrow. What could change? How do you feel about that? Do you feel it's likely, unlikely? And that's where strategies evolve. Now that now that's B lenders, right? Yeah, B lenders absolutely. trying to find um, trying to trying to find a workaround. Uh, any updates with any A lenders right now? Like any any of the big name, you know, your big banks and you know, your MCAPs and your your Manulife's, et cetera. So there's been small changes. Some of the so rate holds are getting harder and harder to find. A lot of the the big banks have the money to just eat through the losses and build it into their margins. Many okay. of the smaller lenders are really pulling back on rate holds. Because what happens when a lender does a rate hold, they have two options. They can go essentially secure or buy money to hedge against the rate holds, which case if those rate holds don't fund, they lose money. Or if they don't hedge enough, and let's say rates go up like crazy, and then a bunch of their rate holds fund, if they don't have enough money hedged at that rate, what happens is all of a sudden they run out of that lower funds, costs have gone up, and now they lose money because they have to borrow at a higher rate to lend you at a lower rate. So one of the important takeaways there is if you have a rate hold that expires, let's say November 17th and rates have gone up drastically, it's relatively unlikely the lender is going to accommodate you with a two, three week, four week extension on your rate hold. Odds are they are not making money to lend to you. So know that if you're writing offers, make sure you line up your offer with your rate hold, ideally with a couple day buffer because in my experience, the success rate on asking for favors on extending rate holds, as an example, is like one to three percent. It is incredibly low. Keaton, can you um, explain what a rate hold is? 
So a rate hold is a fancy piece of paper that does not guarantee financing. It simply says that if the bank approves you within a certain window to buy a property that meets whatever you've submitted for, let's say a rental, let's say owner occupied, whatever it may be, if they approve you, they will honor a certain rate they've given you. The biggest thing to know is that rate holds are called pre-qualifications, pre-approvals, rate holds. There's lots of terminology for them. They are not a guarantee to financing. The number one way I see newer investors, newer people in real estate in general get in trouble is they get pre-qualified and they think they're good to go and they write a subject free offer and they very <laughs> quickly learn that pre-qualified does not mean qualified. Mm -hmm. And and so why exactly are rate hold or why are banks cho lenders choosing to change their rules about rate holds right now as opposed to in the past? Like we've never heard, I've never really heard about lenders having to change their policies on this. Um, you know, what is it specifically about this particular time in the market that's that's uh, forcing them to do that? Because is it because the, the rates are changing? Yeah, we've had more change in interest rates in one to three month windows than we used to get in years. Right. Which is obviously creating a lot of risk for them as lenders. 100%. So if everybody Googles five-year bond yield Canada, goes to market watch, they'll get a chart. If you set that to, let's say three years, actually better yet, go all. You'll notice that there's, if you look at the overall changes, yes, there's been periods of change, but there's also been pretty solid lulls of stability. From September 1st, 2011 to June 1st, 2013, Rates were basically perfectly flat, two-year window of it. Then there was a little bit of volatility for a little bit. By September of 2013, rates trended down very slowly until November of 2014, so very stable period. Then we had a sudden change. And then from March 2015 all the way till October of 2016, stability. Then we had some volatility, which was the lead up to 2018. That was another rate increase cycle. But then once again, we had the market start to cool down. We had some changes, rates trended down, and then we hit COVID and it plummeted. Then we had that lovely period of stability we all enjoyed until 2021. <laughs> rates went up a little bit. And then all of a sudden we hit August of 2021 and the rocket ship went off. <laughs> and there's been more change in the last two years than there was overall in the last like eight years. Sheesh. So, the rate and frequency of changes in rates has, as an example, we all know, well, maybe we don't. There's something called a variable rate mortgage. So that is a fixed payment variable mortgage. That product was fine. There was no issues with it for like 15 years. All of a sudden rates went up so fast that people started hitting trigger rates and trigger points, which meant that because their payment was fixed, but the interest rate changed, all of a sudden their payments didn't even cover the interest they owed. And the government got really upset and the banks felt stupid and we saw a lot of change. So the bad news is there's been a lot of change and that rates have gone up. And yeah, that sucks. We can all agree that the good news is there's a lot of change and with change comes opportunity. So it's a matter of just putting the energy in to say, yeah, hey, let's be honest. Real estate investing is not as lucrative from a principal pay down perspective as it was when rates were one and a half percent. OK, it's built milk. Get over it. What opportunities are there today? We're seeing a mass exodus of people from Ontario and BC to Alberta. There's an opportunity. As an example, we know that when someone moves to a new province and they have to start a new job, they do not qualify for a mortgage. They have to get the new job, stabilize it for a period of time. Maybe it's three to six months. Hey, Wayne and Gabby, do you think there's maybe an opportunity to have some sort of specialized midterm rental that caters to those people? For a premium, you set up some sort of opportunity to help them move, stabilize, and then buy. Is there maybe an opportunity to tie that in with wholesaling energy, rent to own? You know, are there maybe multiple strategies that can be combined to this trend of population immigration? Alberta? Maybe. I, th I think we have a few workshops and home study kits in our master's program that could cover that yet. <laughs> so the point is, though, that there's changes. And yes, some of them suck. But with everything that sucks, there's some sort of opportunity that's popping up. And I think that's the key thing. And there's a, there's a stat that from the, the Great Depression in the 1930s, 
There was more millionaires created then than any other period of time. So it, it's interesting how bad times create wealth. Mm -hmm. For those who understand the opportunity. Yeah. For those that look for the opportunity. No one understands it first. The people who understand are the ones that look and research. They don't just yeah. give up. It's a very good point. Uh, Keep. we're kind of getting towards the end of the show here. Um, I just want to thank you for everything that you've given. We are always, we always go above and beyond and, and we always, you know, dive into things that we never thought we would touch on. And um, everyone always sends me private messages afterwards being like, yo, that episode with Keaton was amazing. Um, any, any closing notes or, or advice that you want to give to investors right now um, that could cover them and their decision making for the next 30 days? Yeah. In six days is the UHT deadline. If you own renters, you own corporate rent, or oh. anything like that. There's a ten thousand dollar fine per property if you don't do this. And you own properties in a corporation. So if you even vaguely think that might be you, call Wayne, call me. I don't care. No, no, do me. not call us. Do not call us. We've been talking about this all fucking month. We're, and we're done. done with it. Yeah, we're I done. know, but it's just it's important. So if you're like, yeah. oh, well, I keep hearing this. Maybe that's me. Like this is your nine one one. You yeah, could have 50 grand to the CRA in like seven oh. days. So keeping you know. the amount of fucking people that are reaching out to us. I mean, like, so what's this thing? So do I have to? Oh my god! Well, send them to me <laughs> because I will send them to an accountant, and they will absolutely fleece you. They'll probably charge you eight, nine hundred dollars to do it per property. Oh yeah, but oh, yeah. that's still a thousand times better than not doing it. Yeah. So, anyways, that's my rant. I know you guys have been beating this dead horse, but at least we can all say we tried. When in nine days we see all the posts pop up about people crying. Oh yeah. my god, I can't wait. Oh, for that. I hadn't thought. No, Wayne, come on. But okay, I no, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not like I can't wait for it, but it is. It, it's going to be a little funny. It's. It's. Um. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about getting to that point, and then the point where people are like, "Oh my God, I just received these fines. Like, what does this mean? What do I do? How do I fight this? You know what I mean? Like, okay. I hadn't. My brain hadn't gotten there yet, and so you just like you just hit me with the like, "Oh my God, this is coming." Hundred percent, and I stand by the biggest risk to real estate investors is the CRA. <laughs> this whole—it's not a bad deal. A bad deal can be dealt with when the CRA gives you a letter that says you owe ninety-three thousand dollars. Yeah, that's that's the, because the, you're you ignorant. Yeah. The good news is that's totally avoidable. Hundred thousand yes. percent avoidable. You just got to do something, and that's called pick up the phone and call someone. Yeah. yeah. And I guess here's the last bulletin. If you work with an accountant and you're like, well, they, they really, they suck. Yep. They just suck. Yep. But I work with them. I've worked with them for years. This is your call to find someone new. Don't settle. The world is changing. I would argue the most important professional in your life is not a broker, is not a realtor, is not a coach. It's an accountant in this world. Everybody else is important, but with the way the world's going, you need a good accountant. Anyways, that's my rant. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Keaton. We really appreciate having you on the show and all the information that you have to share. And um, yeah, how can everybody get in touch with you if they want your knowledge on their team? Uh, www.kbmortgages.ca or better yet, just add me on Facebook. Perfect. Damn. All right. Okay, well, Keaton and everybody have a fin fantastic Wednesday. Make it a good one. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, Keaton. Bye-bye, Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Interested in being a guest on the show? Send us an email to info at reimorningshow.com. 